chapter 14. The fifth planet was very strange. It was the smallest of all. There was just enough room for a street lamp and a lamp lighter. The little prince couldn't quite understand what use a street lamp and a lamp lighter could be up there in the sky, on a planet without any people and not a single house. However, he said to himself, it's quite possible that this man is absurd, but he's less absurd than the king, the very vain man, the businessman, and the drunkard. At least his work has some meaning. When he lights his lamp, it's as if he's bringing one more star to life, or one more flower. When he puts out his lamp, that sends the flower or the star to sleep, which is a fine occupation and therefore truly useful. When the little prince reached this planet, he greeted the lamplighter respectfully. Good morning. Why have you just put out your lamp? Orders, the lamplighter answered. Good morning. What orders are those? To put out my street lamp. Good evening. And he lit his lamp again. But why have you just lit your lamp again? Orders. I don't understand, said the little prince. There's nothing to understand, said the lamplighter. Orders are orders. Good morning. And he put out his lamp. Then he wiped his forehead with a red checked handkerchief. It's a terrible job I have. It used to be reasonable enough. I put the lamp out mornings and lit it after dark. I had the rest of the day for my own affairs, and the rest of the night for sleeping. And since then, orders have changed? Orders haven't changed, the lamplighter said. That's just the trouble. Year by year, the planet is turning faster and faster, and orders haven't changed. Which means? Which means that now that the planet revolves once a minute, I don't have an instant's rest. I light my lamp and turn it out once every minute. That's funny. Your days here are one minute long. It's not funny at all, the lamplighter said. You and I have already been talking to each other for a month. A month? Yes, thirty minutes, thirty days. Good evening. And he lit his lamp. The little prince watched him growing fonder and fonder of this lamplighter, who was so faithful to orders. He remembered certain sunsets that he himself used to follow in other days, merely by shifting his chair. He wanted to help his friend. You know, I can show you a way to take a rest whenever you want to. I always want to rest, the lamplighter said, for it is possible to be faithful and lazy at the same time. The little prince continued, Your planet is so small that you can walk around it in three strides. All you have to do is walk more slowly, and you'll always be in the sun. When you want to take a rest, just walk, and the day will last as long as you want it to. What good does that do me, the lamplighter said, when the one thing in life I want to do is sleep? Then you're out of luck, said the little prince. I am, said the lamplighter. Good morning, and he put out his lamp. Now that man, the little prince said to himself as he continued on his journey, that man would be despised by all the others, by the king, by the very vain man, by the drunkard, by the businessman. Yet, he's the only one who doesn't strike me as ridiculous. Perhaps it's because he's thinking of something besides himself. He heaved a sigh of regret and said to himself again, that man is the only one who I might have made my friend. But his planet is really too small. There's not room for two. What the little prince dared not admit was that he most regretted leaving that planet because it was blessed with 1,440 sunsets every 24 hours. Chapter 15 The sixth planet was ten times bigger than the last. It was inhabited by an old gentleman who wrote enormous books. Ah, here comes an explorer, he exclaimed when he caught sight of the little prince, 
who was feeling a little winded and sat down on the desk. He had already traveled so much and so far. Where do you come from? the old gentleman asked him. What's that big book? asked the little prince. What do you do with it? I'm a geographer, the old gentleman answered. And what's a geographer? A scholar who knows where the seas are and the rivers, the cities, the mountains, and the deserts. That is very interesting, the little prince said. Here at last is someone who has a real profession. And he gazed around him at the geographer's planet. He had never seen a planet so majestic. Your planet is very beautiful, he said. Does it have any oceans? I couldn't say, said the geographer. Oh, the little prince was disappointed. And mountains? I couldn't say, said the geographer. And cities and rivers and deserts? I couldn't tell you that either, the geographer said. But you're a geographer. That's right said the geographer, but I'm not an explorer. There's not one explorer on my planet. A geographer doesn't go out to describe cities, rivers, mountains, seas, oceans, and deserts. A geographer is too important to go wandering about. He never leaves his study, but he receives the explorers there. He questions them, and he writes down what they remember. And if the memories of one of those explorers seems interesting to him, then the geographer conducts an inquiry into that explorer's moral character. Why is that? Because an explorer who told lies would cause disasters in the geography books, as would an explorer who drank too much. Why is that? the little prince asked again. Because drunkards see double, and the geographer would write down two mountains where there was only one. I know someone, said the little prince, who would be a bad explorer. Possibly. Well, when the explorer's moral character seems to be a good one, an investigation is made into his discovery. By going to see it? No, that would be too complicated. But the explorer is required to furnish proofs. For instance, if he claims to have discovered a large mountain, he is required to bring back large stones from it. The geographer suddenly grew excited. But you come from far away. You're an explorer. You must describe your planet for me. And the geographer, having opened his logbook, sharpened his pencil. Explorer's reports are first recorded in pencil. Ink is used only after proofs have been furnished. Well, said the geographer expectantly. Oh, where I live, said the little prince, is not very interesting. It's so small. I have three volcanoes, two active and one extinct, but you never know. You never know, said the geographer. I also have a flower. We don't record flowers, the geographer said. Why not? It's the prettiest thing. Because flowers are ephemeral. What does ephemeral mean? Geographies, said the geographer, are the finest books of all. They never go out of fashion. It is extremely rare for a mountain to change position. It is extremely rare for an ocean to be drained of its water. We write eternal things. But extinct volcanoes can come back to life, the little prince interrupted. What does ephemeral mean? Whether volcanoes are extinct or active comes down to the same thing for us, said the geographer. For us, what counts is the mountain. That doesn't change. But what does ephemeral mean? repeated the little prince, who had never in all his life let go of a question once he had asked it. It means, which is threatened by imminent disappearance. Is my flower threatened by imminent disappearance? Of course. My flower is ephemeral, the little prince said to himself, and she has only four thorns with which to defend herself against the world and I've left her all alone where I live. That was his first impulse of regret, but he plucked up his courage again. Why would you advise me to visit? he asked. The planet Earth, the geographer answered. It has a good reputation. And the little prince went on his way, thinking about his flower.